here you see that we have really a very, very strong setup. We have uh, Agnès Benassi-Quiré, who is the chief economist at the French Treasury um, and a member of the Bruegel Board. And she's a professor at the Paris School of Economics and chair of the French Council of Economic Analysis. I could go on, suffice to say, she is absolutely equipped to be on this panel. Um, I would love to sit next to you at, in a brasserie or a pub because your experience and expertise is so far from my own. So brilliant that you're here. Who else do we have? We also have the lovely Peter Stein. Look, I, I said the word lovely, didn't I? Financial counselor and head of unit ECOFIN at the Permaret of the Netherlands. Um, so before coming to Brussels, uh, Peter did actually work at the Dutch Ministry of Finance as Deputy Director at the Inspectorate for the Budget. He's done all sorts of things earlier in his career. He did study economics. Again, that's good because this is quite a difficult topic. But you've only been in Brussels a year and a half, I understand. So you're still kind of sort of getting to grips with the ropes. Uh, Rasmus, where are you? You're on the front row here. Rasmus Andresen, who is of course MEP and head of the German delegation in the Greens, the EFA group in the European Parliament. So he's a member of the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee and also coordinator of the Greens in the Budget Committee. So plenty of things for you to bring to the party. And we also have Ludovic Tutosochel, who is a senior research and advocacy officer at Finance Watch. So this really is very much all of this topic is his baby, very much the European Economics Government Review, Governance Review. He's published lots of reports and he was also a member of the European Commission's Technical Expert Group in Sustainable Finance and involved in the creation of the EU taxonomy for sustainable activities. Activities. So that gives you a sense of who we've got. Now, Ludovic, I'm going to ask you to come up first, because as I said, you've also got slides. And after you've laid out your stall, I will then invite the rest of the speakers to come in and you will get your moment in the spotlight uh, to lay out your own stall. So thank you, Ludovic. Please push me off the lectern. You can give him a warm round of applause too, if you will. So oh, thanks, kids. Uh, thanks first, all of you, for coming in, in large number, in spite of the quite technical topic. And of course, thanks for the speaker for accepting our invitation. Clearly, it's challenging for me to pass after Monsieur Bouti. There's clearly many goods in the European Commission proposal to review the European fiscal rules. But taking into account the short amount of time I have, I will only make, only present two facts and two main proposals to maybe slightly improve uh, the complex proposal already made. Like this, okay, perfect, done. So first, something that will seem quite obvious for many of you, but not for all, a state is not an household. Often said that similarly to an household, a state should not spend more than its revenue. In the case of a state, taxation revenue. But in fact, a state is not an household. It is therefore not expected to manage a budget and debt like one. As a state is eternal, it's not the case of an household, of course, it does not really have to run budget surplus to be able to reimburse its stock of debt. In fact, they don't reimburse. They roll over the stock of debt. Each time new debt arrive at maturity, they issue a new one. So what really matters for the debt sustainability of a state, it's clearly partly the stock of debt, but it's also the flow of debt, which can be captured for those that know by the growth financing needs. It's mostly two things. First, how much it costs for you as a state to roll over your stock of debt. This is captured by the annual interest payment. And second, how often do you have to roll over your stock of debt? And this is captured by the average maturity of your stock of debt. These two indicators that go beyond debt to GDP allow you to have a different picture of the question of debt similarity in Europe. So here you can see on this slide, the annual interest payments, so what we call debt servicing cost, in the EU. As you can see in the 1990s, all the main countries for the euro area were between 3.5 and 11% of GDP. Nowadays, they're somewhere between 0.5 and 4%. So, so this is the cost of rolling over your stock of debt to make it simple. Other part, the average maturity, how often do you have to roll over your stock of debt? We move from three to nine years to seven to 11 years in the euro area. I just wanted to point these two facts to make you understand that the dynamic of a big, big debt is not as a dynamic of an household debt. And that debt to GDP has sometimes to be take with some distance, let's say. 
The second uh, point I want to make is the fact that the current fiscal rules are unable to capture debt sustainability and are in fact mostly arbitrary in nature. It's well known that uh, the fiscal limit embedded in the European treaties, so the 60% debt to GDP and 3% deficit, are arbitrary thresholds. They are, they are not based on scientific evidence, and basically there is nothing that happened at 61% debt to GDP, 70, 80, 90. It's, and if we have this number, in fact, it's because they are broadly the average of public debt back in the day in 1990s when we decided to establish the Maastricht Treaty. But more fun fundamentally, debt to GDP is not the appropriate indicator to capture debt sustainability. Let me show you uh, an example here. Here you can, say the you can see the government debt to GDP in 2020, so it's a very special year, for many countries, uh, the country in red, country outside of the EU, in blue, inside the EU. And you see the level of 60% debt to GDP, the reference value in the annex uh, to the treaty, uh, the European Treaty. So the big question could be, as you can see, many of these countries are far above 60%, but does it mean that their stock of debt is unsustainable and that there is something to do that they really need to cut their debt? At least it's not the opinion of the financial markets. Here on this slide, what you can see is the credit rating of Japan, United States, France, and Ukraine. As you can see, Japan, 256% debt to GDP in 2020, United States, 160, that's changed nowadays, France, 124, they all have excellent credit rating from the Moody uh, credit rating agency. But Ukraine, and I, I want to say first that these are number from 2020 and also for the credit rating, Ukraine had debt to GDP below 60%, was around 50, but still the assessment from the financial market from the credit rating agency was that it was maybe not, it was risky to invest in their public debt. What I want you to keep in mind with that is just that um, they are not only debt to GDP, there are other indicators that capture that. And what credit rating agencies, in fact, are doing, so we check Finance Watch is mostly composed of former investment banker and the rest, and we check the methodology of all the credit rating agencies. And when you take a look into how they analyze uh, the credit worthiness, let's say, of a country, the most important indicator for them is the economy of the country its size, its complexity, its ability to be resilient to shock, um, its uh, growth prospect. And then they have other pillars of analysis among which you have clearly public finance. But in public finance, debt to GDP is one indicator. The other one are the one I showed you before, debt servicing costs, average maturity, and plenty of other. So I want to say you that is because one of the contentious issue about the proposal of the commission is that they suggest to make to allow country to come with country-specific debt pathway based on debt sustainability analysis. From a finance watch perspective, we think it's an excellent proposal that's really based on the literature, the most the state of the art knowledge about debt sustainability. And we think it's really something that should be uh, promoted uh, because the debt sustainability analysis, in fact, take all these indicators into account, try to understand the interaction also apply some shock to them. So it's some sort of stress testing for public finance. And just wanted to start by at least uh, supporting this proposal, which is challenged by some member states at this stage. Now I will come to the, the two points and I will try to be as short as possible. The first point is that ensuring debt sustainability requires not only to look at past a debt dynamic based on past value is basically what debt sustainability are doing in general, but also to have a forward-looking approach to future risk. Let's take an, um, an example to make it a bit more clear. Let's take climate-related risk. There is a growing amount of evidence that climate change will affect our economy, that some feedback loop exists between the economy and the financial system, and that all of this will require a different level, different way the, the states to do something and it will, let's say, lead to important costs for public budget. I don't really have the time to go to the different number of this risk, but I, I just want you to know that this notion of the risk of climate change on public budget is called climate-related fiscal risk. And there is uh, an institution that started to assess this risk. What you can see here is the estimation by the Office for Budget Responsibility in the UK 
of the impact that climate change could have on the UK budget by 2050. They made it and run different uh, scenario, including different uh, type of change, reform, technologies, and arrived at a conclusion, for example, in the late action scenario, that climate change could lead to as much as plus 45% of debt to GDP by 2050. It's clearly not the only risk facing Europe. I just wanted to put an emphasis on the fact that only looking at debt dynamic in the short run is not enough. We really have to take into account what could happen in the long run. And therefore, we have to do two things. As part of the review, there will be a new mandate for what we call the EU independent fiscal institution. We think, as Finance Watch, but with many other organizations, think tank and civil society organizations as Climate Action Network, that they should be required to, uh, all the independent fiscal institutions at national level should be required to produce this fiscal risk analysis. But just doing analysis is not enough. So second point is the necessity to do precautionary investment to reduce this risk. So continuing on the example of climate change, for the EU to achieve its own environmental objective, it of course needs reform. But not only, it also needs to raise an additional 450 billion per year. So it's between three and four percent of EU GDP, the so-called green funding gap that you can see here in the, the estimation by the Commission in 2020. The, the number is a bit higher uh, nowadays with uh, the power EU. And this funding gap has to be bridged by private actors, sure, but also by the public. There is a different role for all of them, and the public can also uh, help to activate some private investment. Um, the public has still uh, to spend more or less among something like 2% of EU GDP. But other um, investment gap exists, as you can see here, public investment gap and many others. I don't really have the time to go in it, but more or less we might have between 3 and 4% of GDP of investment need in Europe nowadays. If state were us all, they would probably have to cut spending to be able to invest and to bridge this funding gap. But the state is not an horse old. As all this investment will benefit multiple generations, financing them via debt is the legitimate way to spread their costs among all the benefiting uh, generation. The Commission proposal is already a big improvement as it creates more incentive and leeway for quality investment and reform. But it maintains the arbitrary 3% deficit limit it remains, and it might make it impossible for some country to breach this funding gap at least in the absence of common European fiscal capacity. So I will finish here. In the absence of debt sustainability risk, there is for us little rationale in applying arbitrary constraint to debt finance quality green investment and make the EU economy stronger, more resilient, and sustainable. They should therefore be excluded from deficit and expenditure limits because they improve long-term debt sustainability. Thank you. One question, because bless you, you had to really race at the end because there's too much to say, isn't yeah. there? In too little Way time, like always, I think we are all aware of that being in Brussels. There is always too much to say in too short a time. However, very interesting. Just one question, picking up on what was said, if you caught it, because it was quite fast at the end. You talked there about the possibility of excluding some categories of spending, which I understand. Uh, but on the other hand, I guess you might get the question, you know, would it would some member states perhaps abuse this system you might get some kind of creative accounting there what how would one you know be careful to avoid mm -hmm. that in a nutshell okay it's a very interesting uh, question indeed thank you um it's indeed we had discussion with different PEM rep different person in brussels commission the rest and this has been raised often in fact what you're asking is the quality of public finance the quality of investment how to ensure that if we give more leeway to member states it will be used to actually do the proper investment. But in fact, the solution is quite simple. What the Commission has done now is to replicate the logic of the RRF, to apply that to the fiscal rules to give more leeway to member states. And the process is basically member state propose a plan where with a country specific debt pathway reform and investment. Then you have technical assessment by the Commission, a service criteria to analyze, and then a de political decision by the Council. The same thing could be applied to this question. You could have authorization for member states to submit a list of future oriented expenditure of green investment of whatever uh, to the commission that could check therefore if they comply with different important criteria like do no significant harm first the commission could do 
adapt sustainability analysis to be sure that the member states can afford to do that. Uh, you can have uh, ensuring that there is respect of the EU objective also in this investment. And therefore, the same way that for the rest of the plan, um, if the Commission approves the plan with the quality investment exempted, then it's up to the Ecofin Council to decide and to say yes or no to the plan, including all this investment that has been ex excluded from the limits. And therefore, you avoid all this uh, mistake normally. And also, and something else that may come up, there is also this focus, I think, that we spoke about certainly before this event on the kind of quality rather than the quantity of investment. But I will park that there just for the moment, only because I need to allow all of these other good people to air their thoughts and then make sure that I leave time for the audience. But thank you so very much. So who do we have next? We have Agnès, please. Agnès Benassikeche. Uh, Chief Economist at the French Treasury. So the presentation is based, as you've seen, uh, on uh, uh, sound geometry, at least. <laughs> and um, so more seriously, uh, so the equation is extremely difficult. So you have to make a balance between different objectives. And I think uh, it's already, uh, it goes already a, a long way. Uh, the balance between a differentiation and common methodology the balance between uh, fiscal adjustment and investment. We've, we know that the previous uh, round of fiscal adjustment has been very detrimental to investment. So we need to be very careful about that. And obviously the debt to GDP ratio, you can work on the numerator of it. You can work on the denominator of it. And investment and, and, and reforms makes, uh, make sense. Uh, and this is uh, the correct, so I, I agree with the focus on uh, debt to GDP and the idea of recovering uh, some uh, leeway to, uh, for the next crisis. So the idea is to build up buffers. And uh, so I agree with Ludovic when, he's, well, Ludovic here, when he says that uh, uh, debt to GDP ratio, uh, of, so we have high, higher levels, obviously. Uh, but uh, what, what is problematic is the dynamic of it. Uh, so for, for it to, to expand every year after year, so there really needs to be, and this is a long process. And I think the proposal um, uh, uh, makes uh, a, a, also a good balance between uh, the uh, short-term short adjustment. So <laughs> in your final presentation of the, the trilemma, uh, your personal uh, view was it's better to focus on uh, investment plus uh, investment plus ownership. And if, it, if you need a little more time to do the adjustment, this is fine. So uh, I, I think this goes a, a long way. Now, if... Um, I want also to say that uh, what is the alternative? So coming back to uh, reversing to all rules is uh, probably not a, a, a viable option. And we, keep, we need to keep this in mind when we discuss the new rules. Uh, you've talked about the 120s uh, uh, debt rule, which is obviously the most problematic. Uh, but we know uh, you, you've given the long list of, uh, of um, uh, the undesirable features of uh, the old rules and coming back to them uh, also would be non, not only non credible but not fit for purpose. Uh, so I think that the idea of, of turning to an operational expenditure rule would uh, also fix the pro-cyclical feature of um, uh, existing rules. And, uh, we, and I, I think it's smart also to, um, to define the adjustment path in terms of structural adjustment and a reduction in debt to GDP ratio. And then when you move to operational rule, then to move to an expenditure rule net of uh, discretionary tax uh, uh, decisions, um, which means that in the upturn, in the, in the out, uh, upside of the cycle, uh, you, uh, this is where governments have fails and and uh, it it gives uh, it puts some pressure on governments when the we are on, on the upside of the cycle so this is uh, good and in terms of the old classification between um rules uh, versus discretion i i can back to can come back to to uh, uh, graph i made so you have on the one hand one size fits all so 3% 60% by the hand, by the by the way this is not a completely arbitrary uh, there is a link between the two. If you have a uh, nominal growth of 5% and uh, that to GDP ratio of uh, 60%, then 3% is perfect. 
Um, uh, so you, you could play around this, uh, but it is not uh, the, the, the game today. So on the one hand, the one size fits all uh, rule on the opposite, you have uh, pure discretion. So no rule at all. Uh, and in between, you have a number of solutions uh, that have been proposed. And in a sense, uh, we have, uh, currently we have common rules with flexibility. So it's kind of top-down approach and you have the vademecum of the commission explaining the flexibilities. And what the commission proposes is a, a little trick in a sense. It's doing the same, common rule with flexibilities, but rather than a bottom up, um, top-down approach, it's a bottom-up approach. Uh, and I think this changes very much the ownership issue, uh, the idea that governments would themselves propose a path uh, and uh, in, uh, a pack of fiscal adjustment, investments, reforms. Uh, so I think a small trick can make a, a big difference. Um, however, uh, of course, the evidence is always in the details. Um, the fact that the commission first proposes a path then gives, uh, in a sense, it returns to the top-down approach, in a sense, because um, this is the rule. And then, well, you can deviate, but then the markets will will know it and uh, so you, you cannot in, in fact you cannot really deviate uh, in a sense um i think also that we need to keep in mind that uh, uh, fiscal rules can will never be a, a complete contract so you cannot think of all possible all possibilities and uh, you, whether you like it or not, or, or not, you always need to have some uh, flexibility around the rule and uh, adaptations, keep clauses. And uh, so this is also something that uh, needs to be clarified, maybe what happens uh, when there's a change, a new government coming. Uh, which, so is the new government uh, asked to endorse um, the path of, of the previous one, so how will it work? Now, um, to be short, um, I also wanted to say that, um, so the, 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 the new rule uh, is also smart in connecting the path to uh, debt sustainability um, assessment. Um, so first of all, maybe the, the key word sustainability is, uh, <laughs> may be uh, worked on because um, uh, it's it, well it's not a full uh, DSA like the IMF is doing it's uh, a part of uh, of uh, of the sustainability agenda so it's in terms of shocks so stress tests and also stochastic simulations and we should not go for something automatic from this uh, exercise to what well, this is the path that comes out of the computer, and you, this would be uh, the reference. Uh, this would be really uh, problematic. Uh, the IMF doesn't do that. Uh, so we need to be careful about that. And then also in terms of ownership, uh, I already had a hearing about the proposal of the commission with the national parliament. And when it comes to stochastic DSA, it, it's not the easier part to, to explain to the members of parliament. So. Uh, I, I, I think we also need to, to, to work. I, I think it's a great idea, uh, but uh, difficult to communicate. Uh, so um, there is a need for a buffer in between the, the uh, stochastic exercise, statistical exercise, and, and, and the past. Uh, finally, um, uh, so you, you said at the beginning, and I was happy with that, that I'm uh, uh, fond of the macro imbalances procedure which is also part of the, uh, of the proposal, although it comes la quite late and that not much detail about it. Um, so the macroeconomic imbalance procedure, for those who don't know that, it was introduced after uh, the EU area uh, debt crisis, because some countries like Spain and Ireland were, were uh, severely hit by the crisis despite uh, having uh, fiscal surpluses. Uh, so there was something else <laughs> in, in this crisis. So the, the starting point was extremely good. And, and then it became a bit complex and not really binding. Um, so we should keep in mind that, of course, we have new challenges, but all generation crisis can still strike back. back. 
Uh, and also we have uh, spillovers and spillovers within the EU area are not only fiscal spillovers, there are all kinds of spillovers. So there's still a case for this uh, MIP uh, uh, procedure. And uh, yeah, so I would encourage uh, just the commission to even uh, push this topic uh, up uh, in the proposal and make it more symmetric uh, with a fiscal uh, adjustment pass. Um, and it can also help uh, devising smart uh, fiscal adjustment pass. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me just check in. You are aware you are still in listening mode. There's quite a bit to get out, but I'm going to prevail upon you to remain in listening mode before I take any questions, because I want to hear from our other two speakers. I have one question for you, and yes, before I pass, may I prevail upon you for your patience, please, just to create a moment between uh, Agnes and uh, Peter, I want to just come back to this issue, which has already been mentioned, you know, the uh, the, the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, so we've got this, you know, Ursula von der Leyen has announced the, the, the Net Zero Industry Act, and that in theory competes, you know, with the US and the IRA and, and, and supports green tech in Europe. So the US has put a lot of money on the table, 400 billion. Um, is the EU able to compete without harming the single market? That's, that's the question. Um, do you think more flexible rules could support those efforts and that aim. Um, and again, how do you how would you view kind of a new fiscal approach that that supports um, you know green industrial policy? Now, this is insane because I'm asking you to comment in a nutshell. I'd rather come back to you in fullness, but if I can have your top lines on that just for the moment. Yes, it's a challenge, but it's got to be done. I'm very happy for you to to fill in some gaps later. But first headline feedback on that, if you will. Okay, so I, I think about RIA, uh, in a sense, uh, this just confirms uh, the challenges that were mentioned by uh, Marco. Uh, the fact that we uh, face uh, uh, very strong uh, challenges in terms of uh, the transition and the industry that needs to back the, the transition. Of course, it's not just about, and we should avoid a race uh, for, uh, for, for subsidies, uh, big companies, uh, can very well play uh, this game. Uh, there are, uh, we have a trade, uh, a trade um, policy that has been reinforced. It needs to be used, uh, not necessarily vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis, uh, the US, but it, in general, it needs to be used uh, within the WTO uh, rules. And uh, also, um, there, there is a, a need uh, to uh, think about what uh, redirecting existing funding uh, pockets uh, that is, are still available for um, the member states to address uh, these issues and we we also need to think about how uh, to um, make the transition uh, the most efficient and it's not just about uh, more funding uh, it's not just about uh, sub more subsidies to the private sector it's also about uh, resilience how to uh, diversify our, uh, so, uh, our supply chains, uh, it, it's all, all, all this. So it's much beyond uh, what we are discussing today, which is uh, the fiscal uh, adjustment. Thank you. So may I turn to you, Peter, when we, when we had a brief exchange before. So I think everybody knows, you know, it's been very clear, the Dutch government and, and you know, the communication that you put out there with, with, with Spain, and now we're talking about this change, you know, in certain members of the government, is that going to follow through? Let's hear what your stance is and, uh, of course, reflect upon, uh, take into account what you've heard from your fellow speakers. Over to you. Thank you. Um... I think a review of the economic governance, governance review, that's the, actually the, the thing we're going to do. What's the way forward for the stability and growth pact? And first of all, thanks for all the organizations uh, uh, making this possible. It's an honor to be here. I think it's the right time to have the discussion. There will be uh, lots of discussions uh, between governments, Eurogroup, ECOFIN in the next couple of months. Thank to the commission, the cabinets, uh, Mr. Booty, of course, uh, but also the staff of DG ECFIN for all the hard work they did in preparing this recent communication. Um, already since quite a while, since 1992, 
um, the Maastricht Treaty was signed, we all tried to find what is the right set for economic governance. Step by step, we are improving the system. We started with limitation of government deficits and debts, uh, strengthening surveillance coordination, a six pack, a two pack, and now the SGP review. And I would like to say the Dutch government is constructive about modernizing the SGP because the current framework is not a goal in itself. It's a mean to achieve sustainable debt levels, levels and upward convergence. And I think Mr. Booty presented quite some failures. Um, um, uh, for example, uh, there are still quite a, a couple of countries with too high debt levels and the rules I agree are quite complex. So a year ago, the Dutch government, um, a new Dutch government started with a coalition agreement and there it was explicitly stated, we approach a modernization of the stability and growth pact constructively when this is aimed at debt sustainability and upward economic convergence in the above, we make effective enforcement a requirement. So debt sustainability, upward economic convergence, effective enforcement. These are the three words which are for the Dutch government important. Um, a common Spanish Dutch paper in April 2022 was a result, step by step to sometimes uh, quite different countries uh, tried to bring other countries together. And I am happy that several elements of that paper have landed in the communication. So what's the opinion of the gov Dutch government? In short, we see some good proposals, but we need some additional safeguards. But I think it's a good idea to start with the positive elements. First, we support the aim to increase national ownership by country specific plans, by strengthening the national fiscal institutions. Second, we think that a stronger focus on debt sustainability risk could be a way forward. Third, we are positive about the use of expenditure ceilings. We use these rules already for quite a while in the Netherlands, and we think they helped us to have a more anti-cyclical budget system. Fourth, we also like the idea of coherent national fiscal plans that take into account reforms, investments and debt development. And of course, we still think it's good to have limits for deficit and, and debt that they remain at three and 60%. So are we there yet? No, we need some clarifications and safeguards. And let me cluster them along four points. Debt sustainability, transparency, good national plans and strengthening compliance and oversight. First, debt sustainability, as I said, should be at the heart of the framework. We are at this moment not convinced that the current proposal would lead to sufficient debt reduction for countries with high and medium debts. We think the framework is served by a minimum numerical debt reduction target that serves as a backstop to ensure sufficient debt reduction. Second, the process from start to end from commission to council should be transparent. The bigger role of the DSA by the commission requires full transparency, predictability, and stability of uh, debt sustainability assessments. The DSA and its translation into reference path should be possible to re 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 replicate, replicate. This could improve incentives through risk-based pricing by financial markets as well. There is a risk that this DSA is a new black box and I am convinced, we are convinced we should avoid it. Regarding the national plans, thirdly, we need some assurance too. It's important that only additional investments and reforms that contribute directly to debt sustainability or, e or economic convergence should be ground for more leeway. So no double counting of reforms which are already in the RRPs. As regard to the fiscal plan, the commission proposes a four to seven years budgetary adjustment phase. That seems rather long. One could say that three to five years should be sufficient. A longer period risks backloading of measures that reduce that debt levels. Um, the fourth point, strengthening compliance and oversight. 
we um, think we need clear rules to secure a transparent and consistent implement implementations of the rules respect to assessment of the plans, openings of EDPs, EDP recommendation, uh, the use of relevant factors and application of escape clauses. Um, transparency, really important. Um, the, the second regarding this is we believe European Fiscal Board should be given a larger role improve, to improve checks and balances on the EU level. The European Fiscal Board could assess the compliance with the rules, which should be considered by Commission and Council. So we are positive and we need a little bit more safeguards, uh, but I think now is the moment to make progress and progress is really needed. At the end of this year, the economic escape clause uh, will end and member states have to prepare the budget for 2024. And in these preparations, it's good and they need to know what our common rules will be. Thank you. And we look forward to the discussion and we really hope we will uh, make good steps in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just a, a quick comeback on that, if I may. Um, this issue, the debt sustainability and the funding gaps. And also you said there, you know, you are not unhappy with the three and the 60. You are, you know, particularly concerned, perhaps you said debt sustainability has to be at the very heart of the framework. There's a concern with those with higher debt or without perhaps, you know, showing that possibility to reduce that debt. But if I come back to, to what we heard from, from Ludo there and come back and link a question there, you know, it, 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 is, it is a percentage that, that, that does go back a long way to another time that is quite decades old. What about some of the suggestions that you heard there from Ludo and also this issue about um, the context, the investments that need to be taken to tackle the cri climate crisis and the fact that if we think too short term, you know, that also is just going to bring so many problems down the road for that very reason. So do you, would you, do you understand that, that request for flexibility? I think the commissions brought into the... Uh the debt sustainability and then that analysis that makes it really oh, the commission brought into the debt sustainability analysis. I think um, that's uh, one step. I think the national plans and the possibility to include reforms and investment in the plans and to make that a full plan works together as well. And I think there are always more needs in society, more wishes to spend money on than money is available. So always countries should prioritize. And um, uh, that's difficult. Um, and we, well, we also tried ourselves to do. Um, and I think with the framework, which is now on the table, it, there is a possibility to do it as well. Thank you very much. We'll leave things there. And um, just to say, we will hear now, you've been incredibly patient, Rasmus, we'll hear from you. I'll have a little bit of chat with these good people, and then we can bring in some questions from the floor. And I would also like to give them the opportunity to, to come back. I know particularly, Marco, there's been some questions and some comments thrown your way, which I need to give you the opportunity to come back on. So if I use my abacus, I know the maths is hard to crowbar in a bazillion questions from you and let us kind of just let some of these discussions play out. So I'm going to try and strike that balance. Uh, but first of all, Rasmus, you've been so very patient. Now, uh, interestingly, can I just say in this position paper from the Greens and EFA, what's written here, which is not a word that's come up thus far, is moving away from a narrow vision of EU economic governance based on mistrust means that we view rules at EU level not as a constraint, but as an enabling condition to orient national budget towards the pursuit of commonly identified EU policy objectives. So interesting there, this whole issue of trust and how one manages that. But let me first let you um, let you expound to the audience. But I'm very interested in, in that because all of this, as we hear, is all about the conversation towards, and I think if I if I go back to what Marco said when he said there are all these policy trade-offs that bite in the short term, less in the long term, he said if we can find some move towards a consensus, we can deal better with those policy trade-offs, hence my use of the word more trust. But over to you first, thank you. 
thanks. And also thanks for the invitation and for organizing this event. I think uh, it's as you already, Peter, also pointed out, it's really the right time to, I would say, start a public conversation, not just within the council or also in a broader public because this is really maybe sometimes a bit tough to discuss because it's about uh, finance it's about uh, fiscal rules and i mean some of you said already that like if you're going out to the street you're asking people then they are mentioning the three percent i think in my district nobody will mention anything uh, because they don't understand and they doesn't seem to be interested in the topic but there is a lot of uh, political uh, relations to actually what is uh, important also for uh, the current context we are living in. And that's also where I would like to start, because I mean, we are discussing this in a very challenging economic situation. We are discussing this with still a war ongoing in Ukraine with a lot of financing questions also linked to the war besides of other maybe also more important elements uh, but still there is also an economic dimension in it we are discussing this uh, uh, where we still are facing the climate crisis we are uh, discussing this where we are still uh, experiencing a lot of inequality all around europe but also at the global stage so we can see there are a lot of arguments for why we need strong and also more public investments and some of you already pointed uh, pointed that out also uh, also in concrete figures so i don't want to repeat and what i really think we need to do is to find also a new definition of what sustainability ability also in fiscal policy actually means because uh, this is not just about debt sustainability and sticking to three or to 60 percent or to both of it this is about how our society should work and uh, and what kind of needs we have and what kind uh, of role also the public the member states but also uh, the european union should play in this and i think that this is quite different than like the debate had been for five six years or even uh, even in the 90s uh, ago and i think there are good reasons for why a reform bigger reform is necessary and why i think that still from the perspective of a more progressive group in the European Parliament, the proposal we are uh, having at the table right now from the Commission is a step, but is not good enough to face uh, the challenges. So what I would like to uh, uh, start out uh, by saying is that uh, looking into, um, uh, into the Stability Growth Pact and how it, the uh, Stability and Growth Pact actually is constructed right now, we can see a lot of problems linked to this. Some of them you already mentioned, basically they are, uh, the, um, the rules are not working because they are like not enforced in uh, many of the member states. And there are good reasons for this, not because member states are uh, like not interested in it, uh, but because there are some of the rules who gives uh, limitations to the member states in economic situations they can't face any longer. And uh, to change this and to change this also in a way that we are actually like also talking about sustainable investments, both when it comes to the greening, but also when it comes to social infrastructure, for example, this is what I think um, uh, the reform uh, should live up to and where I think that the Commission is quite good in explaining the challenges, but looking into the concrete measures, they are lacking a lot behind. And I'm not talking about what I think is necessary. Some of the member states are more talking about what is possible from their perspective, but I really think that at this stage, we still also need to talk about what is possible, uh, what is necessary, and then afterwards uh, talk about uh, uh, what is possible and where limitations uh, maybe uh, also, uh, also are. But this is like something I think is the most important thing to boost sustainable investments, to have a clear definition of what that means, both on the green side and on the social side. Um, and uh, the second one I think is, uh, really important is the question on uh, on governance on accountability on democratic scrutiny where i still think that looking into what the commission had communicated until now looking into what member states are uh, communicating on this one i really think there are still some open questions uh, where we need to find answers as greens in the parliament we are fully supportive of more flexibility the rules 
like they are now are not working. And one of the reasons for this is also that there is not enough flexibility to enforce the rules and to take into account the current situation, economic situation, member states, but also the EU is in. But on the other side, this also needs, of course, to be followed up by uh, by comparing, for example, comparability, uh, comparing also the situation in different member states to find clear criteria on the enforcement side. And there I really think that um, the proposal of the Commission is not clear enough and there is still a lot of room also for uh, a maneuver and for uh, like concretizing it before like the legislative chambers, let's put it like this, uh, in the EU uh, can, can vote. Uh, on a proposal. And um, my last point is maybe more linked also to the question uh, if we are like dealing with the nationalization uh, or a European approach when it comes to fiscal policy. And what we could also hear in some of the statements made by the colleagues here on the panel earlier, this is a lot about the national situation and putting a framework forward member states can deal with with their national budget and this is basically what the rules are about so that's true but on the other side um, if it should have a meaning to have also like european fiscal policy where the fiscal rules the stability and growth pact is one element of it then we also need to see what's the european approach in this i mean for me it's important to have like fair rules transparent rules rules that give also member states maybe with a tougher economic situation, a better possibility also to address some of the challenges. But on the other side, I would also like to see a, a, a much more European approach, which means also that we also need to strengthen, for example, the possibility for um, um, investments at the European uh, level for European projects, common European projects, uh, so that we can also like enforce um, the challenges, fiscal challenges we are facing together. And there, I think that elements, and we did discuss this now because this is not part formally of the proposal, but this is part of the conversation, at least looking into the EU response on the Inflation Reduction Act. We also need to address, for example, the issue on the European fiscal capacity, um, uh, things like this. Um, I think at the end, we will end in a uh, situation where some member states will be more in favor of flexible fiscal rules. Some of them would love to see a uh, investment fund and some others looking to France or to Germany would love to have a reform of the state at both. But at the end, we need to have different, uh, uh, different elements uh, fitting all of Europe with all the complexity and diversity we are also having like when it comes to the economic situation. And this is why I think this also needs to be addressed. Um, also in the panel here because this is like part of the conversation um, but I'm really looking also forward to the debate and I really think that one of the most important points is also to, uh, to get into the deb uh, debate and also to push for more ideas and uh, so that our perspective also in the debate will be much broader and there is a kind also of public pressure to get some things uh, done I would like to see and maybe some others as well. All right. The first thing I want to do, and I have a few questions of my own. Um, I didn't know whether I could draw you further on German government position. I mean, you've touched upon it. But you need to keep it short, though. Yeah. Well, no, I just want to see there's lots of conversations going around. These good people are well aware that there's lots of, you know, and I didn't know whether you wanted to share any more of that or some of those conversations or... Yes, the link linked to this particular topic in the German government, because the German government, as we know, does have a lot of influence. The German government is followed by other member states. Therefore, I would be curious in a nutshell to hear if there's anything else that you would want to share on that. Oh, I can I can do this. I mean, there, it's not not a big secret that like in the German government, there are quite different positions on this. I mean, I'm member of the Greens in the European Parliament. Uh, thankfully, I do not represent the German government, but the Greens in the European Parliament, which is much easier. Um, uh, but of course, uh, in like like in, in our in our party with our colleagues in the government, we we agree on a lot of concrete elements of what I already pointed out as the green position. On the other side, we have the liberals uh, um, with a quite different uh, position. And the 
discussions are still ongoing and I would say that it will depend a lot on the concrete proposal at the end and uh, what actually uh, is, is in it. I think that Germany is opening a bit up on the issue of investments, especially green investments. I mean, for many years, Germany had it said basically no to everything linked to disability and growth pact and now they are saying we are open and discussing it we are like uh, ready also to listen to others but where this will end it, it's quite interesting uh, but i fully agree it's it's important because i mean like uh, there will be no reform of this without the german government that's for sure um, and what we are actually waiting for is that once our chancellor will take a clear stance on this and then uh, maybe this can also open up the debate a bit. It was a little bit, can I just say what we talked about, you said, you know, the Dutch government has opened up about this from being, you know, a little bit in the same, you know, in the same vein previously and now there is more going towards. Is that is that how you would also, does that resonate yes. for you? Uh, I would say that... Um... Uh, the Dutch government is really looking, uh, we see the problems as the current system, we are, uh, we think it's good to uh, start the discussion, we are really constructively uh, doing it, and we put together with Spain some suggestions on the table, we are really happy it's in um, the Commission proposal, and as I said, Maybe, maybe we are sometimes a little bit like Germany, but uh, we are open constru constructively doing the into this discussion, but we need some safeguards. And maybe Ger um, the German uh, uh, Minister of Finance, but I cannot think for him, is a little bit tougher on the safeguards before going uh, starting the constructive discussion. Um, but... Um, uh, we need. We see that there need to be some uh, some changes. We are happy the commission uh, put the proposals forward, uh, but as I try to make clear, we are not there yet, and we have um, some points. We we either need uh, see more clarification or more safeguarding. Thank you. On that note, thank you. That's a nice segue. I'm going to leap over you to forgive me just yep. momentarily and come to you, Marco, because I think there is a, you know, it would be good to hear from you in as, I know it's a huge ask in as concise a way as possible. But if I look at some of the things that, that, that our speakers did um, emphasize, you called for a definition, a better definition uh, in fiscal policy, you talked about sustainability on both of those fronts. And I think you said, listen, greening and social infrastructure commission explains well, but I'm not so sure about the, you know, the measures to implement, whether they're quite all there. We also had um, some comments from our a French colleague there talking about, well, has it really changed from top down to bottom up? Is there really room for discussion? What happens when a new government comes in? Does it have to endorse the previous plans? And then there was certainly a comment there about the DSA. We need to be a little bit careful. And sometimes I believe you said it's a challenge to explain it uh, internally. Uh, nationally. So perhaps you could come back, not on everything, but make some clear comments on just a few of those areas, if you will, as concisely as possible. Thank okay. you. Um, okay, first of all, let, let me thank the, uh, um, the speakers. Um, I think there was a, a large degree of convergence. I mean, I'm used to committees, uh, so this one is, uh, is almost a piece of cake. Um, <laughs> Uh, and in, in short, I mean, should you lock us in a nearby room here with our sandwiches? I think we would come out by the end of the evening with uh, with an agreed proposal. So that is uh, so. If this is a state of play, either we have uh, we are not a representative sample, or uh, I think the commission has put forward something that uh, is a good basis to work on. Um, on the, uh, the various points, um, I think taking uh, one point per what you mentioned, Katrina, then one point per, uh, uh, per speaker. Um, I think on the um, uh, on uh, Ludovic, uh, yes, I mean on the um, considering different categories of spending, excluding, etc. I think you made the point, but then you gave it a solution that uh, the, the Commission actually put forward. Uh, or very close to that, because I mean, we do not exclude uh, 
uh, and category of spending also because you want to, if you start to, uh, to highlight what is the good spending, what is uh, very valuable spending, what is strategic spending, et cetera, you start to, uh, you know, to go in all directions, it's very difficult to. So in a sense, a some diversification is, is uh, possible considering the um, European priorities and the country specific recommendations and member states can come forward with their plans and argue for, uh, uh, let's say, a, a, a special treatment of uh, some uh, spending, not that you exclude them because you have to finance them anyway, huh? uh, but you could allow a, a more gradual debt uh, reduction. And you mentioned the RRF as an example. Uh, and here, I mean, in a sense, what we have here is uh, at the RRF approach where instead of having, and it is a much more powerful uh, instrument, uh, you know, money coming with it, uh, it is a bit more, it's more time, more gradual uh, uh, adjustment. Now on um, uh, Agnes, uh, I think we, we have tried to marry uh, a bottom-up approach with some, you know, top-down, which is, implies uh, the bottom-up bottom uh, from, from coming from the member states are, have to respect some commonly agreed principles and criteria. Um, we know that certain countries would like uh, uh, very much the top, others they like very much the bottom. Uh, and uh, I think what we, come, we came forward in the communication, which is this sequence that I have presented in the slide with the communication, the commission kicking the, the, uh, the process, but we reference, reference paths, not with uh, you know, firm proposal that member states can take in turn and, uh, and uh, come up with uh, the same or different, um, I think is uh, something which I personally believe is, very is going to be very close to the landing zone uh, uh, eventually. Now on uh, Peter, um, again, I think uh, you mentioned the uh, Dutch Spanish uh, paper. And if you look at the spirit of the, of the commission proposals very much in that line, at least in terms of the broad coordinates, um, you think not, the, not sufficient debt reduction. Uh, I think there um, my plea for having a gradual but credible debt reduction, I think is a very, important element and i warn against uh, you know trying to uh, you know invent new algorithms for uh, you know uh, replacing the 120 i mean my very long experience uh, lead me to the conclusion that uh, algorithms are intelligent ex ante and bound to be stupid exposed so um, that is uh, i think what uh, that's why we we do not tie our our hands in terms of a new formula huh? Um, now, the uh, uh, Rasmus, uh, um, and uh, the point of, uh, and yes, on the new government coming, I mean, we quote in the communication, Katina, you mentioned yourself, um, objective circumstances, uh, which would bring the possibility to, to review. Clearly, the plans and the, and the adoption by the council is based on, uh, you know, you priorities, country-specific recommendation principles. So, per se, the simple change of government is not uh, is not something that would lead to uh, uh, necessarily to change. If there are changes, we have to go through the process of adopting a new plan. So it means the council will have to give the uh, agreement. Rasmus, uh, um, uh, yes, uh, I think. Let me say one thing for, uh, for 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 you. I mean, you mentioned what is not there, and it is very important. I mean the is the center of fiscal capacity. I have to say, personally, very attached to that. I have uh, you know, worked and written uh, a lot on that, on center of fiscal capacity, on European public goods. We have tried, uh, uh, and we are aware of this is, uh, is, is an issue. Um, uh, we decided uh, not to overcharge the boat at this stage uh, in order not to uh, derail the process. And, uh, and uh, in a sense, give a good excuse since the issue is controversial. I understand you like it a lot, I do as well, um, but no, everybody uh, does. So the risk was that if we put that on top and as part of the, of the package, then uh, the, the risk is that would, it would sink the whole, uh, the whole exercise. So I think, uh, I personally think that 
it's useful, important. I think it can be designed in a way actually to strengthen a center of capacity, to strengthen by eligibility conditions also the credibility of the rules. But I think the commission, in its wisdom, decided not to um, go uh, there. Keyword. A white is okay. Uh, Rasmus doesn't think so, but okay, you see that. Uh, okay, uh, I think a key issue here, uh, you mentioned Katrina before. I think the key word uh, uh, is trust. So rebuilding trust is key in the whole, uh, in the whole uh, exercise. Now, let me conclude then with the, um, since it's not part of the, of the um, governance discussion, but uh, it has come up uh, and myself put it in, the, in one of the corners of, of, my, uh, of my figure. So which is the competence response to IRA, uh, et cetera. I think we have two issues here. Um, and the commission will come forward, by the way, with a communication on 1st of February, um, feeding the uh, February European uh, Council, which discuss, is going to discuss uh, this. Then it will come, I think, in a more specific way on the March European Council, um, with more specific uh, proposals. I think there are two issues that we have to safeguard here. One, the integrity of the single market. So the issue here of uh, state aid, uh, you know, loosening without any uh, considerations, and I think I think it would be very very dangerous. So, so that is integrity of the single market is key. That's why uh, I think any um, controlled review of the state aid um, framework, temporary state aid framework, will have to go hand in hand with uh, I think a common common element. Uh, that is uh, uh, that would reassure that there is a EU um, uh, component and not only and not only uh, you know differentiations based on depth of pocket of fiscal pockets. And here, the President of the European Commission has mentioned uh, since the beginning of the crisis, uh, over 600 billion uh, state aid uh, adopted. Uh, you know, over three quarters of that from two countries alone, uh, Germany over half and France, I think overall 78%. So we cannot have uh, put in peril the single market on that. And second point with um, on the response to IRA, we have a strong interest in keeping our continent open. We are, uh, um, you know, we depend much more uh, on the others. We export more. We would like to become more resilient. I think more indigenous growth but we will remain inevitably in, this, in the global system. So I personally like uh, more, uh, let's say, made with Europe than rather made in Europe. Emphasizing the, uh, let's say, the bionivocal uh, relations with the others and value chains in which we do not unilaterally depend on others, but the others depend on us. Thank you. This, but I'm not sure it makes a huge difference to you. I'm going to come to you in just a moment. I'm just going to come to Ludo first because you are one of the organizers. So you were doing two things there. You were nodding sagely and you also looked like Rodin's thinker at one point. So I yeah. felt I needed to specifically come to you, whether it's to come back on the response that you heard from Marco there when he was talking about this, well, perhaps not special treatment, the debt needs to be repaid, perhaps a more gradual debt reduction, if there's something that you might want to respond to, or just generally from what you've heard, um, a comment, a beautiful nutshell comment that you may wish to share. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Um, so yes, I will start briefly by answering it to, to Monsieur Betty and maybe make a quick point on the remark from Peter. So yeah, I understand that the, the system you build is really clever and allow when member state present a plan to only have to reduce its debt after a certain amount of time and give some leeway. And in it, you present also investment reform. So in sense, it really look a lot like the proposal we made. The only fear I have, and it's not very clear, is, is it possible for member states to come and propose a list of investment that will lead to 4% of deficit, but it's for a very clever and far-reaching green industrial policy to help the south of Italy, for example, to really develop. And you need not just a bit of money, not just a bit of deficit, but really something consistent. In this case, I have the impression that we are still bound by the limit of 3%. And so that, yes, the system is there, but missing the last point of 
taking some distance from this. So I also understand that before launching the accessibility justice procedure, the Commission has to do an Article 126 report. They will check into relevant factor. You need there is some part and some leeway to understand. And when deficit are there for investment and for EU objective, plenty of things. This relevant factor has been expanded at each reform. So there is some leeway before launching next year deficit procedure, and it's good. Uh, but uh, I don't know if it will still be enough to allow for some country to really do what's necessary to grow out of debt. Because, okay. and then if yeah. I can directly go to the point of, of Peter, because it's related, you said that, uh, yeah, there is always more need than money available. And on this, uh, I, I'm not sure I totally uh, agree on this fact. Of course, there is a finite amount of money too, but it's not defined by the fact that you are in deficit or not, or your debt to GDP. It's about the ability of the market, the capability to provide this funding. And this is more like in some case, there is a level of gross financing need of state that can be too much for markets. But again, it depends who are your investor, if they are at national level or if they are abroad, there are many things that count in okay. there. And so as it's not really about debt to GDP and the problem is not there, you can be at 100 or 200 percent debt to GDP with certain structure of debt and certain, let's say, institutional framework support of central banks, like the case of Japan, and have no problem in continuing to go okay, in debt. Okay, can I allow you to answer needed. that? I'm going to park that one. Just answer. Can you do a quick answer before I come to Marco? If I would like to take the the question from the audience, but uh, a quick response to that, please, Peter. Um, <laughs> maybe, yeah. First of all, Japan and European Union are different cases. Um, I think what levels public debt becomes problematic, it's dependent on many different factors, uh, strength of economy as well. In Europe, with 27 countries together, um, uh, we uh, each has their own budgetary process and one single monetary policy, we have to converge. That's the thing we did for quite a while. Looking backwards, I think the debt crisis, the European sovereign debt crisis, taught us valuable lessons. Um, it has shown that the fiscal position can worsen substantially. Um, member states may run into problems when investors lose confidence. And also when, um, yeah, we've seen recent turbulence in the, in the United Kingdom as well. So I would say, um, uh, be careful in this. And of course, I understand the need for investments. And uh, when I take one step backwards, I think you showed in one of your first slides how uh, how much interest payments as percentage of GDP decreased in the couple of uh, last years. And it could have been for all the countries uh, uh, a decision to use this money for investing. And I'm afraid that for almost none of the countries, the, 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 the free fall of uh, interest payment is used for investment. I'm afraid it's not used in the Netherlands either, but that could and should have been quite a way forward as well. Okay. Um, Can I stop you there? Yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. We can so talk for ages. There's a I know, and it's so tricky. Sorry. No, go ahead. You want, yeah, let me just, let me just turn to the audience first, because it's just a Anyone else in the audience who will also have a question? So we're going to hear these three, keep them short, try not to ask them to the whole panel, or at least if you do, I'm only going to select one or two of you. Yeah? Okay, in a moment. So first of all, over to this lovely lady here, please, in the scarf. Hang on a minute, just take your, take your mic, and of course, do please say who you are and to whom your question is addressed. Yes, uh, Sarah Edwards from Housing Europe. So we're representing the social, public, and cooperative housing bodies across Europe. They're investing approximately 50 billion annually in um, new build and, and obviously renovation. And depending on how they've clever they've been in adapting their system, some are actually struggling with um, deficit rules because a lot of their investment is on balance sheet. Um, and obviously we can clearly see, let's say, the added value of having a having um, an adequate energy efficient home particularly at the moment, what would that, what that would, the impact that would have on the local economy. Um, so I would like to maybe just get some advice, maybe, I think, um, from, I think, Peter, 
Uh, maybe, I mean, because I think this question goes in a similar vein to Ludovic. So you're talking about yeah. the industrial reform that is needed because in housing, we, re we really do need massive investment. Okay. Uh, maybe Perfect. just slightly to add to that, because what met the, the comment from our, um, our Erasmus Andres and what this means to the man on the street, because obviously in the last decade, we've seen massive private investment in homes mm -hmm. um, up to 600 billion in one year in the last decade, went to a trillion in the top 100 cities um, globally okay. in existing real estate. So it's, it's this contrast. How do we explain that Perfect. to citizens? Perfect. We have limits on investment. And yeah. at the same time, we have Thank massive- Thank you, because you're, pre you're, you're actually preempting a question that I did want to anyway come to Rasmus, uh, a link in terms of, you said, you know, if you go out into the street to, a, you know, nobody's going to know what a 3% is, but for all of these big issues, particularly on social infrastructure, particularly on housing, particularly on all of those key areas, where is civil society's involvement too in all of the conversation about the governance, you know, the, the, the reform of the governance framework? So thank you for that. Hold that thought a moment, Peter, that's perhaps one for you and others, but hold that thought. I cannot get to everybody, okay? Uh, two other questions, please. We had a question here from this gentleman here. Thank you, Marcus Trilling with Greenpeace. Um, I have a question to the whole panel. Why did none of you dare to read out loud the writing on the wall that austerity regimes are looming back? Is it because you think Italy, for example, will have a 5% growth rate? Do you think inflation will do the job? Or do you think really the current energy crisis, one Europe is the last crisis and governments can lean back, market will fix it. Um, so how, 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 how do you see this? Thank you very much. We had a third question that came over here, I think, the lady at the back there. Thank you very much. And again, say who you are. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Sarah Muravsky. I work for the Sustainable Finance Lab based in the Netherlands. Uh, thanks for this uh, awesome panel and for the opportunity to ask a question. My question will be addressed to Mr. Buti. Um, recently, like five days ago, there was a report published uh, on behalf of the Econ Committee or requested by the Econ Committee. It was written by a former um, commission employee. Uh, and he says that the commission's communication on the uh, governance review implies two things. And one is that uh, there is more need for uh, debt finance investments. Uh, so that means we need to accept that there will be permanently more debt finance investments. And secondly, uh, that this also implies that there is a need for more uh, central uh, centralized finance, which means uh, fiscal capacity. Do you agree with this reading? If not, why not? Thank you very much. I'm going to pass to you first, actually, Rasmus, to 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 come back because you've been most sphinx-like. And by the way, nobody gets the bottle of champagne unless you consider those very long four-sentence questions. But I understand, um, and you're all super smart, and it's very very difficult, and you need to make your points. But Rasmus, I mean, this this issue, I mean, particularly the the investment that you know now you know these housing associations are needing to do in Europe. There's a real struggle with the deficit rules, and just I mean, in general, this this issue of this is all for the citizen. We've heard about a call to make things more mission driven, more mission oriented. Um, what are your thoughts? Yes. Now, let me first of all say to the champagne issue, as a member of the parliament, we have some problems with colleagues not declaring gifts. So uh, I would also prefer to talk, to speak a bit more and not to get any gifts uh, here tonight, but just. Uh, uh, no, <laughs> so, so we agree on this, actually. No, I just want to say that, like, I mean, I fully agree with some of the last um, uh, speakers from the audience, because um, also we can have a closer look on what actually happened in the 90s when you're looking on when actually the, uh, the Stability and Growth Pact, but also... Uh, the debate uh, took over um, on public budgets, also in the member state, what actually happened. And I think the housing sector is a very, very good or sad example for this, because the housing uh, sector is one where privatization uh, and financialization, actually, uh, my group in the parliament made a very, very great, uh, interesting study about this um, as well, uh, led to enormous consequences we can see ending up in, in really big uh, social problems when it comes to the housing sector in a lot of countries in Europe, in a lot of bigger cities, but 
as it is now, not just like because it is like Berlin or I don't know, because other cities in, in Europe, but also in smaller cities, this is already starting and especially the ones where private um, um, uh, companies are, are running uh, the game. Uh, let's let's put it like this. And uh, in uh, there where like there is more public housing, still social housing, the situation is much better. And one of the reasons for why this also needs to be addressed in um, this panel or in the context of the stability and growth pact is of course that uh, if we are sticking to uh, some tough rules there and this is what will happen if there are not like some parts we can exclude from the uh, from the rules um, then we will uh, maybe end up in a situation where we are facing uh, big cuts again in, in, in national budgets uh, in public budgets and then of course this can also lead to social cuts we had seen in some of the member states hardest hit by the financial crisis some years ago so this is very important so thanks for for mentioning this and for me this is also a bit of an example for what you mentioned Marcus uh, on the austerity issue because this is an example for it and uh, what I want to say but maybe I forgot uh, in my initial statement is that we shouldn't end up with a situation where austerity will um, dominate uh, uh, public finance uh, in in Europe again and this can be addressed on different examples uh, and and I really think that um, we also some had learned the lessons of this but I'm afraid of that some of the reform is falling too short so I don't think like talking to the commission talking to others, also to some of the member states, maybe more in favor of this, um, would like to see the same consequences because they're uh, like in 2009, 2010, because there had been a lot of research that actually the way like Europe uh, dealt with the crisis at that time were terrible and even made the situation not like socially harder, but also economically harder. But on the other side, if we are not ready to address this in a broader way and a more ambitious uh, understanding, then maybe we will fail again. Not because we are like missing, uh, uh, the understanding is lacking like maybe 10 years ago, but because we don't have a majority or there, the ambition is not high enough. And this is what I'm really afraid of and why I think we still need to like push in this direction uh, within the institutions, but also in the public debate. Thank you so much. And you know, what? I've been so unintentionally, I have not come back to you, Agnes, which is actually so not what I do as a moderator. So I'm going to come to you next. Very important that you get to speak. And thank you for that, because it does sort of echo or does speak to this kind of stalemate that exists between those countries that have got more call for flexibility and those who are more concerned about debt sustainability and this kind of sticking point there and where things might be. Am I allowed to ask you to come back on that one first, this issue of, you know, are we at this real, surely we're at risk of austerity reforms looming? And please do come back if there's one other point that you would like to respond to that you have heard or heard from your fellow speakers. Let me just give you a bit of space to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to bring a, a more positive uh, note uh, in, into this discussion. I think in Europe we have a, a great asset, which is uh, that we have excess savings uh, today. And these savings can be used. And the transition obviously needs to rely massively on private spending, not on public spending. It, it needs to, otherwise it won't work. And uh, so there is a, a question, of course, there is a question also of moving from maybe less consumption to more investment, but on the whole, I, I'm not quite. I'm not too uh, pessimistic uh, about how how aggregate demand is going to evolve because we have these needs and there is these savings that can be used to to finance these needs. Now there is, of course, a, a, a debate about uh, public-private uh, division of, of work. Uh, probably uh, the, the public sector needs to be much more targeted in, in its uh, interventions. It's not just funding, it's also regulation, um, pricing, uh, carbon pricing, and all this uh, that can have massive effects uh, on, on the private sector. Of course, there's need to, for, for compensation of uh, low-income households and also to, to help uh, firms to, to make this transition. Uh, hence, I'm talking about uh, uh, targeting. Uh, but it, if I look at social housing in my country, social housing is in a much better shape than private housing in terms of uh, um, uh, energy efficiency. 
uh, the, the buildings are more efficient than uh, the private sector. So it's more a question of subsidizing uh, some uh, private renovation rather than a, a huge problem of for social housing. And social housing uh, on aggregate, uh, uh, there is, uh, uh, the return is not bad at all. Uh, so it, it's also a question of the re regulation of this housing. It can be also private social housing. Uh, so uh, so it's I think it's it's country specific, and we need to we need to go into the details. So I, I would not say uh, so I think uh, saying that the public sector needs to finance the transition is just saying that it won't happen. So we 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 need to be very very careful about that, and I'm not too pessimistic about. Uh, uh, austerity and uh, so it's, it's more a reallocation uh, reallocation from private public from different sectors it's more a reallocation issue it's a big issue uh, than uh, a question of aggregate demand thank you very much uh, can i prevail uh, are you fine if we go till 10 past six we did start a bit late are you okay with that yeah, you've got the energy to just hear a little bit. And of course, we have not even delved into into everything. Let me come to Peter there. And not least, we had a third. I mean, you there was also a call about the housing issue and the question which we've heard from the French perspective. Perhaps we can hear now from the Dutch perspective. And then there was also the question that, that came that there has been this this paper. There's been more need for debt finance investments, perhaps something central, you know, fiscally speaking. Perhaps you could give your thoughts on that as well. Those two questions. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think regarding housing, and that's one of the examples that a lot of the decisions are specific, country specific, I completely agree. And it's difficult to organize all these issues top down from Brussels. And maybe that's one of the good parts of uh, the, uh, the communication by the commission, which really gives possibilities to country to come with their own specific uh, plans. And, um, and in each of the countries, there are choices to be made, either in the, the green transition, but also on education. And I am convinced education uh, is as important for the future as all the other topics we discussed. And I also know that um, that's are not real investments in the sense that we, by pure taxonomy, we can say this is an investment. So that makes always, always me a little bit hesitant to go to these green golden rules or what sort of golden rules you can imagine. Uh, European fiscal capacity, I think, yes, you, you said the right thing. If that would be on table with this communication as well, it would be... I can't believe it. there would be a solution before the summer. Uh, it would be long, long discussions. And I think that's um, uh, we need to do the economic governance review. And as I said, uh, we should go uh, faster. Um, and um, I am happy that you didn't put too much on the boat that it would sink. Uh, so thank you for that as well. First of all, Rasmus, you wanted to, to come in, and then Marco, you wanted to come in. Yeah, and just very briefly, but I just would like to say that my feeling is that it's too easy to argue that the housing issue is a national issue. Of course, like it's not the European Commission putting a framework forward addressing uh, the housing crisis in Europe, but there are some developments and some needs I think we can see in close to all countries in Europe. We have a problem in, when it comes to housing, when you're looking on, on, uh, on, on the present situation, the situation that people uh, can I, I don't have uh, like like uh, the cost of living crisis also linked uh, linked to housing, where I think you can see some developments going on in a lot of cities that bigger financial uh, corporations actually are getting into the markets, uh, uh, got into the markets in the past, and this is like a trend that yeah, we can see in uh, in many cities. And if this is like a global trend, we can uh, see in Amsterdam, like we can see it in Berlin, then uh, and we can see global corporations operating at a global level. Then this also needs to be addressed um, at uh, European level. And I really think that the member states could do much more uh, to support 
this uh, as well. And the second one is on the investment needs. Uh, no matter if you have like a social housing crisis or if you just have a green investment gap when it comes to housing, you need to spend money on this. And you need also public money on this because we know from many uh, studies that uh, this will just be addressed if there is like public spending and then of course private spending needs to uh, be additional on 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 the public uh, on the public spending but this is how it works and this means that you also need to have room for maneuver to address this and to spend uh, so you can spend money in the, uh, on this and then um, we have some countries in Europe where this is easier possible because there is still fiscal space like Germany for example but maybe also other countries uh, with a bit of speaking time here today and there are other countries where there is no fiscal space uh, linked to the common rules uh, um, we we are uh, uh, we are uh, dealing with in Europe, and they need to get the space. And this is why I really think that the housing one still is a good example. And that's from my understanding, it's too easy to argue for that this is like a national topic um, because there are some elements on it at European level as well. Let me just say, giving you, it's 1803. I know Marco wants to come in. I have one more question on transparency and on civil society, and they can just be, because I don't want to miss those two. And then I'm going to ask for a last word, which is to complete a sentence, and I can release you all in 10 minutes for drinks and finger foods, which is just ridiculous. I mean, canapes. Over to you, Marco. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, telegraphic, austerity. We will come to austerity if we leave it to the market. Now, um, markets operate along hor horizontal and vertical lines. So we go from benign neglect to Armageddon. Uh, so uh, it is in the interest of more fragile countries, actually, to have credible and enforceable rules because they give a pointer uh, to the markets and they can, we can, as I said, um, implement a strategy of uh, fiscal retrenchment uh, without, uh, uh, without uh, uh, going back to the austerity that we experienced during the global financial uh, crisis. I think, I personally think it's an illusion to think that we do everything via the denominator, not adjusting the numerator, numerator being the deficit essentially, and the denominator being the, the you know, GDP. I think so we, we, have, we can work on both sides. Uh, recovering adequate, moderate level of primary surpluses I think is, a, is essential after the, uh, and I think this will come, it will not be excessively hard because of uh, the swelling, the deficit, a lot comes from uh, you know, subsidies, which hopefully will prove temporary, not, uh, not, not permanent. So this is, um, I think, and what we, come forward with, that's why it is important. I think Peter mentioned it before, after the general escape closed, that we have a framework, which is going to be in the interest really of everybody, but mainly countries which are you know, potentially more under threat from the, from the market. Uh, second point is the debt, more debt financed investment. I think- Keep it uh, really nutshell, if you can. No, in a, yep. in a nutshell, absolutely. So I think there, uh, yes, and the idea was, I mean, to have, a, 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 a more gradual debt reduction is behind that. I think more centralized investment, I expressed myself before. I can only conclude on the issue of, I think Agnes mentioned, private uh, investment. And here, I mean, if you think about the kind of investment that we need for the green and for the digital transition, these are investments which are typically long in ideas and short in collateral. So it means that we need capital market union, private uh, equity to finance them. And here, capital markets, uh, capital market union, fundamental in order to foster the reallocation of resources towards this kind of, of investment. Banks cannot do that uh, on, uh, on their own. Can I just stay with you just for a last one, please? And again, please, 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 just three points, three points, because it has come in and I don't want to ignore the online audience. So thank you for this one. The criticism of the old economic governance framework wasn't just on the macroeconomic side, it was on the transparency. We've heard about that and the, what do you want to call it? The governance, the democracy. Um, three sentences, three ways, or if you can't express it like that, because that's far too facile, just very 
short. How does the Commission plan to ensure that oversight, that democratic oversight, which I'm sure the Parliament also, you know, is very important? What, how do you ensure that? There is a call for it, there is a demand. I, I try to give, uh, I will give a technocratic answer uh, here. I mean, the fact that we have a more bottom up uh, process with discussions uh, and presentation on national plans, I think that would help uh, a lot. I think we are going to empower more independent fiscal institutions at the national level to have more oversight and more transparency. I think the the kind of discussion that one would have uh, in parliament, uh, but across the society, I think would be very important. And I think the fact that we have multiple objectives uh, on the positive side and not only on the disciplinarian side, I think should help to, uh, um, you know, to have more involvement uh, of uh, you know, public opinion in general. Thank you very much. I'm going to park it there because I can hear glasses clinking. And I'm sure you all need to get your hands on something cold and hopefully alcoholic. Um, I did want to say more. I particularly, let me just tell you, so to tell you that, that if we had had more time, I would love to have talked more about, you know, this point that you brought out, Ludo, this climate related fiscal risk to be included. So there isn't just that short termism and also strengthening the role of the IFIs. Perhaps that could be something you, and you'd said to me beforehand, listen, Kat, the IFIs are there, but they're much more robust in certain countries like the Netherlands than they are in others. But perhaps that's that's really something to put in their remits, to put in their heads. I didn't, I wanted to look a bit more on enf enforcement procedures, but I was told that then we wouldn't get out of here probably before midnight. So I didn't put that too much on the table. Um, certainly I wanted to look a bit more explore in depth. And what I did here is this quality as opposed to quantity, you know, being a more effective um, approach. Again, that was something that came out in your position paper, the Greens, this framework that doesn't focus only on the quantity of spending and borrowing from a very narrow accounting perspective, but instead assesses its quality. And I think that's something very much that Ludo, you brought out. Uh, Peter, you said the European Fiscal Board should be given a larger role to improve the checks and balances at EU level. That was another one we didn't have time to explore too much. And also the absolute importance, you just touched upon it there, Marco, of not just civil society involvement, because, hey, we are talking about benefits, <laughs> infrastructures, you know, investments in all of that that, that is beneficial for me, for you, for the European taxpayer, for the average citizen. So civil society involvement, but also national parliament invol involvement. And sometimes it's not so easy having those conversations. And sometimes those conversations, as we know, are very split and contentious. So, so many different areas. Now it's half a sentence. So please prove to me you can do this. Here you go. I want you to complete this sentence and I can release these good people for some alcohol. A European economic governance framework fit for the future, but I think we can all agree that those future challenges are now. So we can possibly take out the word future challenges. A European economic governance framework fit for the future challenges that are already here must focus upon. Now, you talked about your areas, the, the difficult about the cyclical bias, the unrealistic pace of the debt reduction, enforcement issues, not enough ownership. You know, what do you think of all of those sort of challenges that Marco cited right at the beginning? If you had to complete that half sentence, that governance framework fit for the future has to focus on, in half a sentence, what is most important for you. And climate and social investments. Yes, okay. Everybody else has to hit that bar of uh, conciseness next to you. <laughs> yes, but he won't give you champagne for it, if you agree. Go on. No, no, I, uh, I really think that the... Um, National ownership is extremely important in each of the countries and within the national ownership, uh, quite the combination of plans, investment, reforms can be done. And I have to say for us that sustainability is necessary. Sure. Without that, we could have big, big problems on other sides later on as well. Thank you very much. That was an un 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 uncustomarily long Dutch sentence, but okay. <laughs> Half an hour, well, the French might be, yeah, hey, I have a French husband, so I might, yeah, go on then, half a sentence. I agree, and sustainability, I agree too. I think that it's a comprehensive notion that includes, uh, of course, climate sustainability, but it also includes macro sustainability. I try to put my idea back. 
and uh, and I think it's, it's a, a case. So, so there are different types of crises that could hit, and we need to balance the, the, yeah. all these crises and to find the the the, the, cri uh, the way <laughs> to avoid all of them. And this is the the challenge. And the, the good news is that the investment needs is large, but it's not something absolutely uh, immense. So it's a few percent of GDP. This is something we can do. Thank you very much, Ludo, for you. So European Economic Governance Framework Fit for the Future Challenges that frankly are already here has to focus on what is most important for you. Oh, uh, wow. Speak, I have so yes, many, I, I so many things. Expect. Let's say refine the view of debt sustainability, understand that debt to GDP is not always an issue, that financial markets, in fact, are craving for more debt, and for, but because they they play the role of safe asset, and so there's not that much risk of uh, lacking funding, and therefore accept to recreate the space for more politics, to open the space for more clever investment. In the end, there is no rule that will allow to control everything. You need, in the end, to have some assessment by the Commission, and then a decision of finance ministry maybe to allow for more investment that maybe will be upon three or four or five percent but if it's what's needed for long-term goal let's do that thank you thank you i'm not sure you'll get a round of applause marco but go for it just try keep it short <laughs> sorry i didn't mean that i i just okay sorry. repeat go on so i have to complete what so this new frame this framework fit for future challenges has to focus what's the most important thing do you think of all of those things that we need to really focus upon and you said there were those six key challenges what do you think we really need to tackle i think we'll have to focus on sustainability and that sustainability means fiscal, means environmental, and means social. And I think we, as I mentioned at the beginning, the, you have uh, potential trade-offs in the short term, but these three sustainabilities actually are complements in the, in the longer term. That's what we should do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I was actually wondering when you said how happy... When you said how happy you were, Marco, about the consensus, and you said we can all go and eat cake in a room, I thought, Jesus Christ, they won't have a consensus on the cake they have to eat. That I'm absolutely sure of. We've got the Dutch, we've got the French, we've got the Italians, certainly not the Germans. So thank you very much. Can you please give a warm round of applause to these very eloquent speakers? Thank you very much. May I give, before you leave, a shout out to Ava. Thank you very much. Ava van den Recht. And... Uh, we've had lovely Ludo at Finance Watch, who has been very, very fundamental in the orchestration of this event, but also two behind the scenes that you might want to chat to. Raise your hands. We have over there the lovely Sebastian at New Economics Foundation and Anton, Anton Os also at Heinrich Böll Stiftung. Thank you very much. Thanks to the technical team here. Thank you so much to you. Thank you for coming in this freezing cold. Thank you for listening so well. Thank you to all of you online. And now eat, drink and be merry and don't forget to tweet. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.